that another time. Uh, so, you know, sorry. And so with understanding that uh, dimensions in God, for example, and I mentioned Psalm 91, and many of us know that went off our head. He says, um, uh, he that dwells in the secret place of, of the most high, of is saying like that's possession of the most high. So the secret place is a place in God and is of God. And so that's a dimension. There's a place in, in the spirit known as the secret place. And that's where he said, if you dwell there, come on, he that dwells in the secret place shall, uh, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So if you're in the secret place, you're covered. There's a season and a place where God has us covered. Amen. So as we are studying and we're realizing that there are dimensions in God, it, it, I took us to Daniel chapter seven, and I preface this, and I, I always want to cite my source. This saying something new or you know some new revelation. I've been studying this book here. I don't know if you can see it. It's called The Courts of Heaven. Um, so it's not it's nothing erroneous, no nothing weird or spooky or mystical. Uh, but I've been studying. Everything lines up with the Word of God. Okay, uh, but as I was mentioning in Daniel chapter seven. Uh, Daniel has started to see a vision and verses um, around 10 and 11, uh, you read that when you get a chance, 10 and 11 was talking about um, the ancient of days who was on his throne and ministering, uh, people were, the, 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 the heavenly beings were ministering to him. There were thousands upon thousands, 10,000 upon 10,000s. 10, 10, and the Bible says that the court was seated and the books were open. Hallelujah. So what Daniel saw in the realm of the spirit was another dimension, another dimension. And in this dimension, Daniel saw a court. And in the court, he said the court was seated and the books were open. He had something he saw as it relates to courts. And so uh, we, we took that and we, we began to break that down. And so what's happening is now uh, Daniel seen the court. So if, if there's a court in heaven, that means there must be some kind of system in heaven, right? And we, when you look at Job chapter one, let me know if I'm talking too fast because this is just a recap. Let me know if, if I need to slow down. In Job chapter one, uh, we, we, uh, when you read that, you will see that the adversary, uh, Satan went up with the sons of God to give an account uh, for whatever was going on. And notice how, how the, the setting of that. He went up and he began to, and he went up with the sons of God, uh, and he went with them to present whatever they need to present before God the Father. Uh, well, sorry, God the judge. They went forward to present him. And he came with them. So just, just remember that scenario, okay? And so um, to understand there's a court. So there are approaches to prayer. And and this is what I want you guys to notice. Have you ever been feeling like, like I've been praying and yet uh, it feels like I'm hitting like this, this, this wall and it feels like there's just no breakthrough in my prayer. I have discovered, um, it, it, it's not a secret, but it's a secret when you don't know it, right? It's hidden. <laughs> it's hidden when we don't know it. And once we get this revelation, it begins to unlock so much for us okay and so uh for the, for the remainder of the weeks in november all that we started talking about approaching god as uh, uh a couple weeks ago approaching god as father in luke chapter 11 the disciples saw john the baptist's disciples praying and that jesus disciples like wait a minute uh they're praying something different than what we're used to praying and then and then uh they were like okay well i want to learn how to pray teach us how to pray and Jesus' example in Luke chapter 11 is very simple. He says, okay, when you approach God, approach him first thing as father. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he began to break down, as we know it, as the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. He began to break that down to them. And this is how we approach the very first approach as it relates to uh, the courts of heaven is approaching God as father. When we approach God as Father, we are approaching Him on the behalf of our personal needs. And so it's okay to pray for yourself. Hello. It's okay for you to pray for your own self, pray for your own needs, because you have needs, right? I, I, there's certain things that you may see. The Bible says that Jesus said, you, um, 
uh, I've tell you, I've given you the power in my name, but yet you haven't asked of anything. That's John 14. So he's saying we have to pray. We have to ask. We have to make our petitions known before the Lord. We approach him as father. And in Romans 8, now we talked about the spirit of adoption. You remember when Jesus was being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And when he was coming up out the water, the Bible says the heavens opened up and a voice came from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That in that moment in the spirit of the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. OK, in that moment, that was the spirit of adoption. When we talk about adoption, it is not again, it is not in our language or in our terminologies. Back then, adoption, to make this real simple and play, let me how I put this. Um, adoption was a terminology used for, for Jewish households. Watch this. When the father deemed it the timing for the son to now take on the role as the authoritative figure in the house. Even though the father is still there, the son now can now act or move as me. This son has been given the authority by the father to now act on the father's behalf. And it's usually, it usually uh, uh, happens to the sons around the age of 30. Okay, so Jesus started, of course, at 30. So you see the parallel there, that when God said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, uh, what God was saying, the spirit of adoption. And so Romans 8 is saying for us to understand our authority, the earth is waiting for the sons of God. Now, the sons of God has nothing to do with gender, but everything to do with your position in God. You have to know that you are a son. You have to know that you are a son. When we understand that we are uh, sons of God, not by gender, but by position, we understand that we have inheritance, that we have rights. Okay. So I, I approach God as father as it relates to my life. Secondly, I approach God as friend. When we approach God as friend, we're approaching him as intercessors for somebody else. And so um, uh, Abraham was considered a friend of God. Uh, a friend of God is somebody who God gives audience to. When you continue in Luke chapter 11, you read past the prayer, you, Jesus, Jesus gives them an example. He said, when you are a friend, let's call it friend one, friend two, friend three, okay? Uh, friend one uh, goes to friend two and says, uh, I'm sorry, friend two goes to friend one and says, hey, friend one, um, I'm needing something, right? I'm needing something done. I'm needing certain food. I'm hungry. I don't have this. Uh, friend one, uh, I'm sorry, I said that back. Friend two, sorry, is the one in the middle. Friend one goes to friend two. And friend two says, okay, hold on a minute. I have a friend number three who has what you're looking for. I don't have it, but I can, I can ask my friend number three on your behalf, and he will give it to you. Friend two is saying, because I know friend three, I know my friend number three will give it to you on the basis of our relationship. So when we approach God as friend, it's no longer my needs. I'm approaching God as it relates to the needs of others. In other words, a friend is an intercessor. A friend stands between God and the person who, do, who doesn't really know how to approach God. And so when you, when we are friends of God, God gives audience to our request. The perfect, a perfect example is in Genesis chapter 18, when, uh, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, if you haven't read that, you know, read it in Genesis 18, but uh, Abraham was talking with God. The Bible says that Abraham stood before the Lord. And the word stood in the Hebrew is saying like he stood as in one who stood in a case or in a judgment or in the council. And we, we got all into that. So you have to kind of catch the recordings. But um, Abraham stood as an intercessor between God and Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though the city was full of sin, uh, God gave audience to Abraham's request. He said, if I could find 50 or 40 or 30, you know, that he started negotiating with God. But because you were, uh, uh, Abraham was a friend, God gave audience to his request. What am I saying? When you think about you and your family 
and a nation and your bloodline and your children and your mother and your father. When we understand that we are friends of God and we approach God now as a friend, we can stand on the behalf of somebody else. Not to say that we can stand as far as salvation. We can stand as far as it relates to judgment because because I'm a friend, God gives audience to my request. And all of this makes it, it, it uh, man, I'm getting myself, but it makes perfect sense because we have to understand there are cer certain things that, uh, let's talk about our families, that are, that is in our families that we need broken. And I need somebody who knows God like that in my family who can go and cleanse the bloodline of the iniquity. Okay, Lord, I'm getting way ahead of myself. And so it's important that we understand our relationship. One as father, is this good already? One as father, two as friend. And as we learned last week, before we approach God as judge, right? We don't want to take on this attitude as if I got it all together, where I don't need help. So this is where Holy Spirit comes in. In the same John chapter 14, Jesus said, if I don't go, then the comforter will not come. The word comforter in the Greek is defined as a legal aid in a court. So when Jesus said the comforter, usually, you know, when I read that back in the day, I'm thinking, you know, how we think of comfort, you know, a hug and a kiss. But no, the word comforter in, the, in those days really meant someone who was an assistant in a legal matter, somebody who was a lawyer or a paralegal, an advocate, somebody who, is, who knows the law, who knows the system, because you don't really know all of it. And so because Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, as we studied last week, Holy Spirit knows the, uh, the will of God. So when we begin to pray in tongues, right? When we pray in tongues, what that does is Holy Spirit stands in the counsel of God as the friend of God. Because when you are a friend, you're able to stand in the counsel of God and get revelations and secrets. So the Ho Holy Spirit knows the secrets of your life because he knows the will of God. So when we pray in tongues, this is in Romans 8, he says, Holy Spirit makes intercessions for us with moans and groans that cannot be uttered. What does that say? And he's saying now, when we pray in the spirit, Holy Spirit now, we, know, we are no longer in the equation. Think about it, because it removes us completely out of the way. And now Holy Spirit stands in proxy for us and presenting our prayer before the, the judge as our legal aid. Because as we're, and we're praying in tongues, you know, sometimes it's, it's, this is rather difficult for a lot of people because they want to pray in English. I want to know what I'm praying, <laughs> you know, because I got specifics. But when you pray in the spirit, this that's why it requires faith. This is why it requires faith. Man, it requires so much faith to do this because it takes my cognitive way of thinking out of the way, out of the equation. I'm no longer responsible. And when you continue reading Romans 8 down, things like verse 26 or so, it talks about Jesus is also our intercessor. So watch it. And not only do we have Holy Spirit interceding for us, we now also have Jesus interceding for us. Isn't that good news? And that, that's just a quick summary of what we talked about. And then to, to bring that in, um, we in, in Revelation chapter 12, uh, John the Revelator talks about um, uh, the adversary, Satan, and he called him the adversary. The word adversary in the Greek is defined as anti-decos, anti-decos. In other words, it's an opponent in a lawsuit, an opponent in a lawsuit, which uh, he is the accuser of the brethren, okay? The Bible says in Revelation 12 that day and night he goes before the Lord. And he's bringing accusations against the children of God, the saints, because he knows there are some certain things in our lives that he can accuse us with and he can hold us bound legally, right? Hold us bound legally in the spirit, okay? So let us go tonight and let's talk about the judge. I hope you got your pen and your pads and your paper. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. 
I'm sorry, you know what? Before we do, let's go to Mark chapter six. I want to read this real quickly. Mark chapter six. I want I just want to show you something real quick. This is not part of my uh notes, but this is something that I've read I read earlier and it kind of jumped out at me. I'm I want to read from verse um I started verse 32. So they went away in a boat by themselves to a solitary place. In other words, what was happening was um, John, the John the Baptist was beheaded. His disciples came, talked to Jesus. Jesus told them what to do. Y'all need a break. Y'all need a rest. And they went away to a solitary place. And that's, what I'm, that's not what I'm talking about. I want to bring out a point. In 32, 33, he says, uh, Mark 6, 33, but many, people saw, but many people saw them leaving and recognized them. They ran together on foot from all the towns and arrived before them. Now, 34 is what I really want to bring out. 34 says this. When Jesus stepped ashore, ashore sorry, and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And this is the point I want to bring out. The Bible says that Jesus noticed that all these people were out here and they look like sheep without a shepherd. And, and the first thing he did, the very first thing he did, he sat them down and he taught them many things. If you ever want to see breakthrough in your life, it has to come, it, it, we must come to a point where we are asking for wisdom. Because oftentimes, is a lot of, I uh, heard this uh, today, I listened to a little podcast, and it was saying oftentimes, when we don't have the wisdom in a particular area, we keep repeating patterns, repeating patterns. And the patterns are simply just mismanagement of whatever area of our life that we feel like is out of order. You know, whether it be your finances, your relationships, um, the list can go on and on. When there is mismanagement of a particular area, we need wisdom on how to manage it because if not, it's gonna repeat again. And again, right? It's the same cycle over and over. So I have to get wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. I, I need wisdom to how to break free of whatever it is that's happening in my life. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Help me out tonight. Uh, so let's go to Luke. Um, let's go to uh, Luke chapter. Uh, Luke chapter 18. I'm sorry. I don't know, I just lost it. Luke chapter 18. And I'm going to throw a lot of scriptures out here to you tonight. Again, let me know if I'm talking too fast. And I will slow down because I want you guys, I really want to catch this. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. This is Jesus again. So from chapter 11, Jesus goes into, you know, teaching them how to pray. And they, they kind of went into more practicing of that kind of prayer stuff. And then we can deal with that another time. So here we are seven chapters later, and now Jesus picks up again with now this is a parable because now they're talking about prayer again. Look at, look at Luke 18. It says, then he spoke a parable to them that men all, always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, nor was they, now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary, my Lord. And he, and he would not for a while, but afterward, he said within himself, watch this. Though I do not fear God nor regard men, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. Then the Lord said, look at the revelation. He said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall God not avenge, watch this, his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them when? Speedily. Come on, somebody say speedily. Oh, man, this is good already. Oh, God. He will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless. When the Son of Man comes, will uh, will he really find faith on the earth? Somebody say speedily. 
speedily, speedily. The word avenge there, as the woman says in, 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 in the regular King James, uh, the word avenge means to render, to render justice. When she said avenge me my, from my adversary, what she was saying was render me a verdict on my behalf that can get this adversary off of, off of my back. And the word adversary is the same adversary we studied last week in 1 Peter chapter 5. In the Bible, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, come on, is walking around as a wrong lion, seeking whom he may devour. So what is he saying? That word adversary, again, what does it mean? We, I said this five times already. anti decos It is your opponent in a lawsuit. Antidecos is an opponent in a court of law. So she was saying, look, I am being pursued by this adversary and he is pursuing me. He is on my neck and I cannot shake him off of me. And so now she is saying she, she does the one thing that oftentimes many of us don't do. She took her situation and her, her case, if you will, I'm, I'm dealing with that in a minute. She took her case to the judge because whatever she owed, my Lord, whatever she owed, the adversary was accusing her as if one, she didn't pay it in full or two, she owed him something and he's coming to collect. Lord, help me. And so what, what the adversary does is he accuses the saints of not doing whatever it is God called for us to do. So he holds accusations over us and he holds them. And, and then the, 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 the crazy part is oftentimes it may not always be us. It could be something that somebody opened years ago that had nothing to do with you, but because it was in your bloodline and it, because it has happened while uh, you're alive now. You you are feeling the ripple effect of it, but but thanks be to God, He says, I am giving you a strategy on how to get verdicts, if you will, on in your favor. How to get verdicts rendered that will bring justice. Come on, justice to your life. Are you ready for a breakthrough? Come on, you got to say, you know what? I've been trying everything else anyway. And nothing seems to be working. I seem like I, I, I'm getting somewhere, but something keeps stopping me. And this widow, her husband is already gone. And now, of course, she don't have the money to pay for certain things. And she says, you know what? I'm taking this issue to the judge. And let me help you out. And so let me kind of go back just a little bit. What we are seeing in the scriptures and uh, what we're seeing in the life of um of the people as it relates to real life. Do you know that this is nothing new? That's why the prayer in Luke 11, Jesus says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Let's go to Hebrews chapter uh, eight. I wanna show you something real quick. Because what we're seeing in the earth, even as it relates to our everyday lives, like right now, as it relates to courts, uh, it relates to judges, it relates to seats, all that stuff that we're seeing, is nothing new. If you read the Old Testament, you'll see they had, you know, they had a, a there's a book called Judges. Hello. <laughs> there's a book called Kings. That all of those, they're, they're not just something that humans came up with. The revelation came from God. The reference, if you will, came from God. Let, let me show you why. Now let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. I'll read that real fast. Just walk with me. For every for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, therefore it is ne necessary that this one, talking about Jesus, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since they are priests who offer the gifts according to the law. Watch this. Here it is. In verse 5. This I want to catch it. Who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Did you catch that? As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, when he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. 
in so much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, come on, which was established on better promises. My, the Hebrew writer is talking about Jesus. And he, what, what he was saying was, and I want to bring out of that was, Moses had to fashion the tabernacle because the way God wanted it, I mean, down to the corners, to the gold, to the, the inch, the centimeter had to be precise because that is how it is in heaven. What God is saying, what we see on the earth as relates to systems and structures, the reference is heaven. Nothing that is happening in the earth is catching God by surprise because it's already, is the, <laughs> heaven is the reference. Come on. Heaven is the reference. And now it's the reference of the courts. It's the reference of the courts. And what does the enemy want to do to the saints as it relates to understanding that there are a, that there is a court in the spiritual realm? The main thing he wants to do to many of us is he wants to wear us out. Come on. And the main thing is oftentimes we're fighting this. We're fighting this battle. Ephesians 6 without and you're trying to fight flesh and blood. Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? So we're wrestling in the spirit. So what does this mean? We, I want you guys to say this. I want you to write this down. Put this on a sticky note. I want you to put it in your phone. I'll do something so you can remember this. It says, I am more spirit than I am flesh. I am more spirit than I am flesh. Why? What does this mean? This is the, as simple as I can make it. When we die, our flesh, this caucus, <laughs> goes back to the dirt. And so now our spirit, the breath of us, goes to God and I would, the Bible says, God breathed into man, he became a living soul. That part of us that remains is still alive. So now the flesh is gone. So my most uh, alive part of me is the inner me, okay? The inner me. So, uh, so it's important to understand this concept. Come on. That I am more spirit than flesh. I am more spirit. If that is the case, then the things that I do in this life on earth has spiritual consequences. Oh, okay. And so when I make and do certain things, whether they be good or bad, they're gonna, there will be consequences, right? And, and I'm not saying this to scare you, you know, but you know, thank God for grace, you know. So God, I want I want to give you balance because there's how many of you been there? You know, there's some things you said, some things you've done. And Lord, if, the, if it had not been for the grace of God, come on, that man, certain things would have would swallow us up. Come on, do I have any uh, witnesses in that one? Lord, there are certain things that I know I should not have done, uh, places I should not have went and things I should not have said or, or thoughts I should not have had, but it was the grace of God that covered me. However, however, there are things that when we continue in sin and or continue certain patterns of our life, then there will be consequences. I, mean, I don't mean, I don't want to try to scare you, but I got to be truthful, okay? There will be consequences, okay? And so the purpose, let's go to Luke 22. I want to show you that. We're going to get back to judge in a minute. Let's go to Luke 22. Am I talking too fast? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm not. It feels like I am. Luke 22. Let's start at verse 31. It says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you are converted or strengthened, return, or when you, are, when you have returned to me, uh, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to be with you both to prison and to death. And the Lord said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not go this day before you deny me three times that you know me. The key thing I want to bring out is the verse 31. Verse 31, 32. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. One translation says, Satan has desired you. In other words, the adversary, the anti decos the opponent, He's looking at your life and he knows there are going to be some areas. He doesn't know what, 
He doesn't know what. He's watching your patterns and behaviors. And he's, he's noticing certain things about you that he says, I'm going to start accusing him of. And if you read the rest of that, oh, God, help me, that Peter, uh, when you know Jesus was going through the beating and the judgment, people came up to him. He said, wait a minute. You sound like him. He's, he, Peter said, oh, no, I don't know. I don't know him. You see what I'm saying? And so Peter started this, his denial process of Jesus. And so what Jesus would let him know was, look, the accuser is asking for you. He's looking at your life and he's saying, okay, I want her. I want him. And I want to take them out of here. But I need legal grounds to do it. I need something to hold them hostage. And, but Jesus, watch this. He says, Satan's desire is to have you, but I have prayed for you. Oh man, isn't that good news? What, remember, who? <laughs> why would Jesus pray for Peter? Why, why did he pray for Peter? One reason, because Peter was his friend. Oh man, what do friends do, guys? Come on. Friends intercede on behalf of their friends and in, in their behalf for God. Come on. Jesus says to Peter, I, am, I have already interceded for you. And notice he says, not if you are converted. He says, when you are converted. In other words, Jesus is saying, he's, he's prophesying. Come on, prophesying to Peter. And letting him know, he says, look, let me tell you something. This is not a matter of if this is going to happen for you. Come on, this is the part. Hey, I hope y'all catch me. This is not a matter of if you're going to come out. This is not a matter of if the breakthrough is going to happen. This is not a matter of if goodness will come out. He said, when it happens, what I want you to do is now you become a testimony of the goodness of God. And I want to take a pause right here because I feel something pushing me. I feel like I'm preaching. Lord, help me. But Jesus, what if I told you the very things that we have to encounter sometimes? What if I told you God was using those moments to bring up another level of revelation of who he is? And he was using us, come on, as a reference for heaven. Oh God, come on. He was using us as a reference. That's you y'all remember the story, you know, when the a man was born blind and he brought the Jesus brought the Jesus and the disciples asked, "Hey, who sinned that this man was born blind? His mama or his daddy?" And and Jesus said, "Nobody sinned, but this happened to him so the glory of God can be revealed through him." What am I saying? I'm saying there are certain, God help me, there are certain things that we go through and God is saying, I am using what you have been dealing with or struggling with or having to uh, wrestle with because I'm going to use that to give a revelation of me. Lord, that's why when you go back to Revelation 12 and the Bible says they overcame him, the adversary, the anti-decos, how? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their what? Testimony. Where do you testify at? In a court. So what I'm saying to us tonight is, Lord, help me. Lord, let me, woo, let me bring this down. <laughs> oh God, let me bring this down. What I'm saying for, uh, to us tonight is when, when we have been, when, when your faith and your life has been put on trial, God is working a testimony out of you. Come on. God is working something out of you. But what the adversary wants you to hear is accusations. Lord, oh God, he wants you to hear. He wants you to hear, well, you know, you, you, you're not this. He wants you to hear everything that you're not. He wants you to hear everything that you have done. He wants to remind you of your past sin and your past mistakes and your past failures. He wants to keep reminding you of all of your errors. So that way you feel defeated about approaching God. So now I don't approach God as a son. I approach him now as a slave. Woo. <laughs> You remember, come on, when you when you remember when the prodigal son went all the way out there and, you know, he's got all his inheritance and he went out there and, you know, he blew it all. And then he started eating slop with the pigs. And the Bible says that he came to his mind. He says, wait a minute. 
even my, my father's servants have bread to eat. I mean, surely I could get some of that. Even though, watch this, come on. Woo, God, I hope this isn't helping you tonight. Even though the son had, had went away and done his own thing, it did not take away his position as a son. Oh, God. So what if, it doesn't matter how far you go and how, how wide you get. It is that you are still, God, you, we are still sons of God. And son has nothing, again, it's nothing to do with gender, but everything to do with position. When, when the prodigal son finally came to his senses, he said, I am going back to my father's house. And what happened was before he even got there, that the father met him, hugged him, kissed him on his cheek and says, welcome back home. What the adversary wants you to believe is that you can get so far out there that the father will reject you. And this is and what, the, what the son did. He approached his father as a son. <laughs> when I'm out there and I'm, and I'm lost and I'm doing whatever, I, I don't need the judge. No, I need the father. I need the father. And oftentimes what, what, what pulls us back into the father's house is the intercessor, is a friend who's praying for us. Come on, you ever had, you know, call them praying grandmamas or somebody praying for you that will keep you. Come on, if you have children or, or you know, or, or nieces or nephews or cousins, whatever the case is, you, you are their friend in the sense of you can intercede on their behalf. You pray for them. You labor uh, 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 with God before them. Jesus said men ought to always pray. What is he saying? And, and let me, let me, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to kind of go back around, but what he's saying is prayer should be continual. And, and then you know, I know we have moments of prayer, you know, when we go and we set a particular time, but I don't want you to uh, get into the place where we're, where we begin to box God in, right? What I mean by that is, man, I feel so bad that I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, put the candles on. I didn't put the worship music on. I, I, I didn't dim the lights and I didn't close the curtain. But oh God, let me help you. Ha okay, let me let's make it a little more practical. Have you ever been? Uh, let me talk about me. <laughs> you ever been in the shower and then? You just feel, you're, you're just thinking, right? But you begin to hear God in your spirit. Has that happened to anybody? Or is it just me? Come on, talk to me. Has that happened to anybody? Because that happened to me a lot of times. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know what I'm it is why. Why? Because that is communication. Prayer is communication. You can be in your car. Where, wherever you are. And you begin to communicate. That is the prayer. God is saying, I want you to, mm, I want you to see me in more than just a place. You carry, come on, we house the presence of God. It is in us. So wherever we go, we're carrying prayer with us. In the Old Testament, this is, I wasn't even going here, but in the Old Testament, they offered incense unto the Lord. And the Lord said, the incense should burn all day all night. Our prayers now have become that incense. We, uh, when we pray before God, it, it is it is burning the altar with our incense. It is burning our incense, sorry, on the altar. And so what's happening is as we pray every day, we walking out the house and as we, come on teachers, and it, I know most of y'all are teachers or, you know, or work around kids and a lot of people, as you're walking into them schools, what are you doing? You're offering incense. Come on, let the fragrance of the prayer Fill the hallways, teachers. Let the fragrance of the incense begin to burn in your classrooms. Let it burn. Come on. You don't got to be loud with it. It's in your spirit. Come on. It is in you that we begin to pray in the spirit. As we pray in the spirit, it begins to move. Come on. Holy Spirit says, okay, I hear this person praying. You don't know what you're resisting when you're praying in the spirit. It could be a threat coming to your school, but because you feel an unction in that moment, come on. It is not because you're so powerful. God, why am I even going here? It's not because you're so powerful. It's because when you are a friend, Lord, help me tonight, God will give you revelation of secrets. There, there could have been a plot against the school or a particular student or a particular teacher. By the time they got out to lunch or go to their car, somebody was waiting on them. But because you stood in the proxy as a friend for the school, 
Oh God, your faith, oh God, your faith caused the plans to be voided because now the friend has spoken. Oh God, and because you have spoken and I have audience with the judge and the Holy Spirit is my assistant with this matter, it will stop. You gotta have faith. So when we talk about the courts of heaven, it is not, it's not a formula. Come on, it's not a formula. I want you to hear this. It's not a formula. It is not like a, a, a new thing. It is acquired or accessed by faith. Somebody say by faith. We, we step into the courts of heaven. Glory be to God. It's by faith. It is not something we have to go find it. You can be in your car and you present yourself. I'm going to get there in a minute. And you present yourself before the judge. Now, it's not me now. The blood of sprinkling speaks better things for me. And Holy Spirit, as we learned last week, Holy Spirit now has become an intercessor. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Oh God, I hope this is blessing you tonight. Uh, Daniel chapter seven, man. Daniel chapter seven, and we're going right back to Daniel. And I purposely kind of stopped. I don't know if you guys read the rest of it, but you know, I kind of stopped here. Jump all the way down to verse 21. Now Daniel is continuing his vision. And just to give you, well, let, let's read it now. now. I'll make this a little simple as possible because Dan, Daniel saw the end times. Daniel saw what's happening in the earth right now. That This is why this is so critical that we understand this. Let's, let's start at verse 21. Daniel 7, 21. It says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against who? Uh-oh. Making war against who? The saints. And prevailing. Whoa, look at this. Look at 21, what ha what's happening? He said, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and was prevailing against them. Uh oh, the saints were being prevailed against. Until, uh oh, <laughs> somebody say until. Oh God, until the ancient of days came. Oh God, and a judgment was made low. Oh God, come on, are y'all reading with me? Until the ancient of days, come on, the judge, oh God, came and made a judgment, and a judgment was made, watch this, in favor, remember, we're still talking about favor, uh, come on, in favor of the saints of the most high, and a time came for the saints to what, possess, somebody say possess, come on, three words you already got already, speedily, until, and possess the kingdom. Thus he said, now watch this. The fourth beast uh, shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms. Watch this. And shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. Come on. And uh, break it in pieces. Then ten, the 10 horns are 10 kings who shall ri arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first one and shall subdue three kings. Watch this. He shall break. He shall speak pompous words against the most high. Shall persecute. One translation said he shall wear out the saints. Come on. Come on. He shall wear. Come on. He's going to persecute. He's going to wear out the saints of the most high. And, and he shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints, oh God shall be given into his hands for a time and times and half a time. Okay, we'll get into all that later. This is, here it is. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. Glory be to God. Who? The saints of the most high. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and our dominion shall serve and obey him. Look at verse 26. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion. Oh, come on. So what am I saying? Oh, God. What the adversary wants to do will help me tonight. He wants to wear you out. 
who wants to wear you out someone that you become so complacent and you you ever been you know you know you go like you go to the gym you go work out whatever you ever been so tired you just lay down <laughs> you just had a good workout you oh I just want to lay down I'm tired man I, I can't lift another weight. I can't run another lap, right? You ever been that tired just working out, whatever, some kind of, you know, just uh, uh, exercise that you're dispensing a lot of energy. And that is the same thing the enemy wants to do. He wants you to dispense and expose so much energy into one area of your life that you don't have time to focus on nothing else. That he wants you so worn out that you feel distressed. But somebody said, I'm going from distressed to dominion. From distress to dominion. And what God is saying, I am moving, come on, the distress of you. Why? Because it's not, oh God, it is to the point where God is saying, this is God, that I am taking the distress and I'm giving you dominion. All it takes is one decision from the court of heaven, come on, to change the trajectory of our very lives. All it takes is one decision. You know how we say there's one word from God? The one word from God is justice. When justice shows up in your life, come on, it, it will change your life forever. Come on, that's the Bible says you, you, you will have dominion and watch this, and to consume and destroy it forever. That's what I'm saying. You will destroy the, the adversary strength over you once the judge has made a decision on your behalf, okay? So here's the question. Let's go to Isaiah 43, and we're almost home. Isaiah 43. The question then becomes, well, brother preacher, how do I begin to move in this thing? How do I get to operate? Because I know you're telling me a lot, but I want to make sure I fully understand what you're saying. Isaiah 43, and then uh, we're going to get ready to wrap this up. Isaiah 43, because we're approaching God as judge. Isaiah 43, let's start at verse number uh, 25. This is God uh, talking to uh, Isaiah about Israel and their unfaithfulness. <laughs> and here it is in verse 25. He said, are you not? am he who blots out your transgressions. Remember that. For my whose sake? He said, for my own sake. And I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let, let us contend together. Now I want you guys to tell me what that latter part of verse 26 says. What does it say? <laughs> what does it say? I'm not this up. This isn't about what does it say? That very last part. The latter part of 26. Y'all got it? Isaiah 43 and 26. That's the latter part. It says, state your case that you may be acquitted. State your case that you may be acquitted. He said, your first father has sinned and your mediators have transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the prince Princes of the sanctuary, I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to approaches. He's saying, look, I need you to state your case. You got to, come on, you got to talk. It comes to the point now where we have to talk. Let's go to Psalm 51 and we're done. Where's, where's what? The scripture I just read? Yeah, I think Jennifer just put it in there.
Isaiah, I'm sorry, Psalm 51. The how do we approach God as judge? How do we approach God as judge? The number one thing we have to do, and we'll deal with more of this next week, we have to repent. Repent. Repent uh, from our sins, transgressions. <laughs> Uh, sins, transgression. Uh, yes, that's right. It, it does say state your case. Okay, let's go back to it real quick. Just, just, just I don't want to leave. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, so much. I want to leave no uh, confusion. Isaiah 43, I start from verse 25 again. It says, I, even I, am the Lord who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. He says, put me in remembrance. This is God talking. He says, put me up. Let, tell me. Talk to me. Let us, he said, one translation said, let us contend. Another one said, let us, let us discuss. One said, let us argue together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Come, come on, have you, have you, come on. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I mean, I watch CSI and all the law and order a couple of times. When someone is acquitted, all the charges have been dropped. Come on. He said, but you have to state your case. You have to talk about it. And there's some things that you know that you've done. And there's some things that you know that your forefathers and people before you have done. And he said, you have to present, state your case so that you may be acquitted and what the enemy will he what he wants you to be to be then his number one device is ignorant paul said in ephesians 1 he prays that your eye of your understanding be enlightened that the adversary the anti the opponent in the lawsuit he is hoping that we do not understand the importance of understanding what's in our bloodline because if we don't look into it, we can't shut it down. Oh, God. If we don't take the time to investigate or ask, you know, our, the forefathers who are alive, you know, how is your life growing up? What decisions have you made? What things have you done? Because if it, if it did not touch you, it might show up in your kid. And if not in your kids, in their kids. Because the Bible says the sins of the father will visit the second and third and fourth generations. So the generational things do, do follow us. They may skip a certain generation, but it will show up. So the, the Isaiah, God is telling Isaiah, uh, God is telling Isaiah is that, uh, put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. Why? Your first father sinned and your mediators have turned against against me, transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and I will give Jacob to the curse and Israel to... What are you saying? Because of the sin, because of the transgression, he said the curse is going to operate. There's going to be reproaches. They're going to... In other words, there will be no breakthrough. Because you have not presented anything. There can be no breakthrough. This is why a lot of people are praying and they're getting tired of praying because I am not seeing the fruit. If, if you have been praying and you've been praying about a particular matter for so long and, and so long and it seems like nothing's moving and nothing's shaking, I am willing to put it up to tell you that there might be something legal restricting or resisting you in the spirit. It could, I'm, I'm almost 99.9 99% sure that there is something resisting you legally that has the breakthrough that you've been looking for. That's why Daniel and Dan, when Daniel prayed, Jesus, God told Daniel, I released the answer as soon as you prayed. But something was resist the prince, the principality was resisting the answer. So Michael, on your behalf, had to go contend 
with what was being held up in the spirit. What am I saying? When we're praying, have you ever been praying? It feels like something is blocking it. Something is holding my life down by the ankles and I can't move. Oh man, something legal has been spoken against you in the spirit or in your family. So it is important that we understand. How do we approach God as judge? Remember, I don't do it by myself because I have Holy Spirit. He is my intercessor. He is my help. He's my paraclete. He's my, he's my lawyer. He's my advocate. So he helps me. So when I go into prayer, I can repent one on behalf of me. Uh -huh. Come on. I can repent on behalf of another as a friend because I am going before the judge for sins, transgressions, and iniquities. And we'll deal with that more next week. These are the areas, the three areas, though, three different categories and three different uh, and three different uh, meanings. There's sin, there's transgression, and then there's iniquity. Let's go to uh, Psalm 51. Somebody say repent. Repent. When we repent, repent. When we repent, what that does, the simply to make it real plain, man, I, I, you know, I try to break this down as simple as I possibly can so that we all understand. When we repent, when we repent, what are we saying? Repent simply means to turn in another direction. You're going another way. In other words, it's, it's more than just saying I repent. Repentance is a matter of the heart that says I am moving from one direction and I'm going in a complete other direction. I'm going another way. I'm going another route. I'm going another, I'm going to another place. So I repent or I'm turning away, oh, come on, I'm turning away from how my family used to do, come on, how they used to act, how they used to operate, I'm turning from how I used to be, come on, let's talk about me, how I used to be, how I used to act, my attitude, my, my dispositions, or certain proclivities that I had, he says, Lord, I am presenting my life, watch this, before I can ever, this is a good point, Put plug this in, before I can ever go before God on behalf of somebody else or my family or my friends, I got to take the log out of my eye. Hello, <laughs> come on. I got to take the beam out of my eye first before I take the speck out of yours. Come on, what, what do you say back in the old day? Sweep around your own front porch before you try to sweep around mine. Come on. <laughs> so, you know, I got to get my porch clean. Hello, I got to start cleaning where... Am and, and, and getting uh, healed and delivered where I am first before I ever try. Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to accuse you, right? Come on. Oh, I, I know that ain't you trying to tell me nothing when you still, can you ever heard that? I know you ain't trying to, because you still got this, that, and that going on. You, you don't have the proper grounds, come on, to try to tell me nothing because you still doing that. You see what I'm saying? So when we go to present anything before the judge, we have to, one, ensure that we have fully repented and we have turned away. And repentance is something, come on, don't, don't be scared of it. It's not, it's not like a scary word. It's, it is a beautiful thing because God is calling. He said, repent so that your sins can be forgiven, right? And so that times of refreshing can come from the spirit of the Lord. So what he's saying is, I want you to turn away from those things. I want you to turn away from it. So that way the curse doesn't operate in your life. Let's go to uh, Psalm 51. Now we might read this in its entirety. How many verses in it? That's not that much. We, I, I'm going to skim through it. And this is where we're going to close. Oh God, we're approaching God as judge. And he says, have mercy upon me, O oh God, according to your love and kindness, according to the your multitude of tender mercies, blot out, watch these, watch the category, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Mm. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin always, and my sin is always before me. Sin is, to, to make it a little plain, let me help you make it plain. Sin is defined as simply missing the mark, right? Uh, so like when I sin, I, I, I was aiming for something, but because I didn't hit it, I sinned, I missed the mark. To transgress simply means 
to know a particular law or order or statute and you go against it. Okay, so sin means I missed the mark. I was aiming for something. To transgress means I know what I was doing <laughs> and I still did it. But iniquity now, it is something that gets deep down into the bloodline. Iniquitous. Iniquitous things is something that, uh, that follows you for a long time. So look at verse three again. For I acknowledge my transgression. In other words, I'm acknowledging that I I know I should not have been doing or whatever the case is. I'm acknowledging my transgression. And my sin is always, in other words, I keep missing it. I know what I'm doing. I keep missing it. You see, you see how that's working? Against you and you alone have I sinned. I done this evil. This is when he and David and Bat, David and the Bathsheba story. And he said, and you have you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when, when you judge, oh God. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you will make me to know what? Wisdom, come on, we've talked about wisdom. Purge me with the hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make my make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit uh, within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways whoa and sinners shall be converted to you deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed oh god the god of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud your righteousness oh lord open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise for you did not desire sacrifice or else i would give it you do not delight in birth offerings the sacrifice of god are a what Broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, these, O oh God, you would not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem, and you shall be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering, then they shall offer bulls on your altar. When you read Psalm 51 again, you will notice what David is saying. He's saying, look, I know I messed up. My sin, my transgression, and my iniquity. So you, God, you have, you are a just judge. And because of this and what I have done, and when you read the story of this whole transaction, when David tried to cover up getting this woman pregnant, he had this woman husband killed. I mean, just had him put on the front line of the hottest battle and said, well, he's going to die anyway. He had this man killed, tried to cover it up. And God said, because of this, because of what you just did, the sword should not leave your house. David's house got so jacked up that one son raped a daughter, another son killed another son, another son tried to take the kingdom away from him. David's house was jacked up because one thing he done, he did not obey the word. And then he tried to cover up the blood. The blood, that's why I say the blood is speaking. When, you sh when we shed innocent blood, there's a requirement. There's a demand in the spirit for representation on how this blood got here. Lord, help me today. And, I'm, and that's a whole other thing about abortions and all that, but I'm not going to get into all that tonight. What I'm saying is, is that when we approach God as judge, we don't, we're not approaching him on our own by ourselves. Romans chapter eight, we have Holy Spirit who is our intercessor. He's our paraclete. He is our advocate. He makes intercession for us. So he stands in the counsel of God. You know, it's like, you know, when you, you ever see them court TV shows, when you have the one who's being prosecuted, he's sitting on the, on the, on the chair and the lawyer is just speaking. He, the lawyer says, you don't say nothing. Just let him do all the talking. If they ask you a question, you say this. Holy Spirit will guide us. Come on, help me tonight. Holy Spirit is our guide. So when we approach God as judge, there's certain things that he will reveal to us as we pray in the spirit.
As we pray in tongues and as we pray the heavenly language, you, you begin to feel and see certain things and begin to get revelations on certain things and what's going on. And the Holy Spirit will tell okay, this area, come on, you can repent for say, Lord, I repent for my, my forefathers for in the door. Come on, hallelujah, that they have opened. God, mm, kotoshaka. Any door that they have opened, that that found it, that is perpetual in my bloodline. Come on, doors and that they open ways they have made that was not supposed to be made. Come on, things they have done that was not, they were not supposed to do. Come on, I pray God tonight, God that uh, we present that Hallelujah in the name of Jesus before you and Father. So we uh, we know our rightful place. Watch this. Ephesians chapter two is so critical when Paul said that um, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Whoa, <laughs> oh, well, we're going to go. And so what, what, what does that mean? So now not only do we take the position, hallelujah, oh God, of intercessors. Oh God, not only does Holy Spirit partner with us, you see the advantage that we have? We have we are seated with me, which means we sit in seats of authority. So now we serve as judges. And I don't, oh God, again, we'll deal with that more next week. Because we're going to deal with sin, transgression, and iniquity, and how and why we have to be seated with Christ. Because when it's all said and done and the new Jerusalem comes down, guess what? We will be judging angels. Come on. <laughs> oh, man. So it's important that we know this, right? Know our kingdom authority. Know our judicial rights. Know that the accuser, come on, he doesn't want us. The widow woman in Luke chapter 18, the Bible says that she was persistent and she kept bugging day and night. She kept bugging. the. He was an unjust judge. She kept bugging him. And so Jesus said, how much more would the, the father, the judge, render verdicts in your favor? If the unjust, listen, if the unjust judge can render verdicts in the favor of a widow woman, he, he didn't re revere God or man. And God, who loves us unconditionally, says, I, I am a million times better than the unjust judge. And I will render verdicts in your favor when you approach me as judge. Come on, hallelujah. So Father, tonight, hallelujah. We thank you, God, that even Isaiah 43 says, present your case. <laughs> oh, God, Ooh. present your case that you may be acquitted. Speak your case. Talk it. So, Father, tonight, let, we talk our cases are personal. Oh, shit. So, tonight, Father, we present our cases per, on a personal level. God, there are certain things about me. Come on, before we go any further about anybody else, come on, I'm approaching God right here from my heart to his heart. I said, God, there are certain things about me, come on, that I want you. Uh, to work on. And Paul said, there's a, you know, there's a, there's something was buffeting me in my flesh. And, you know, I prayed and I just couldn't break it. And he said, well, my grace is sufficient. So these, these are one of the times in those sort of moments where we understand that, you know, that God uh, uh, will grace us to, to have certain uh, shortcomings because it keeps us humble. Come on, you ever been there? God, you you know there's certain things, man, I don't like when I talk like that. I don't like when I, I you know, but there's certain things that, that keeps us persistent. Hallelujah. But God said there's other times to where when you have a case against you and the enemy has accusations against you, that when you say, you know what, Lord, I repent. And this is why I, you know, I made it a very uh, 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 adamant last time and about, you know, certain areas, especially for a lot of people, they, we don't know how to give. And because we don't know how to give, we just, you know, we, we don't, we don't receive anything. Right. And so what the enemy does, he accuses us. He said, well, I, you, nothing, you're not supposed to bless that one because you you said, if you give, you shall receive. 
You said, yo, so he accused us. So like when we, when we don't offer forgiveness, right? Well, wait a minute, Lord. Oh, judge, as he calls, you don't call. Your word says, so he uses all these accusations against us. And so it prohibits or limits the move of God. So when we say unforgiveness blocks our blessings, it's more than just, you know, holding on. It is a case being used against you. You're being accused of unforgiveness. You're being accused of being greedy. You're being accused of lying. You're being accused of, of stealing. You're accused of slander. You're being accused. And when you are accused, there's a case building against you. And he doesn't, he doesn't, the enemy does not relent. He keeps coming. So now, you ever notice that, and, and then we're done. You ever notice that, you know, certain things, your mama had it. Now, auntie got it. You got it. It's almost showing up in one of the kids, you know, in the grandkids. Why? Because it's, it's, it's being used against you. And what we don't know will harm us. So what does that mean? We have to start asking for wisdom. God in the earth. What can I do to change the trajectory? Yeah, I know everybody in my family has some kind of poverty issue. I don't want that no more. So give me wisdom. And he would say, you know what? Okay, be a good steward with your finances. Know how to live right. Know how to, uh, 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 don't go blow everything at Michael Kors. Come on, you know, I, I like Michael Kors. But you know, don't go over there on Michael Kors and blow all your money at Michael Kors. Store up. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children. Children Know how to understand. So if, if, uh, if, you, if you are, you know, you can't be eating, you know, fried chicken morning, noon, and night. You know, you they, they, you got to have good management over your body, over your your mind. Certain things you don't need to be watching because it, it it's, it's poor management when you're watching or listening to certain things and it's messing with you. You can't even sleep well at night because you don't you don't loaded your head up with whatever else. So well, you got to manage your mind. Come on, somebody say I got to be a good steward. I have to be a good steward over my life. Come on, let that be one of your declarations. I will be a good steward. Come on, we believe in decorations. Be speaking the word of God. I will be a good steward over my life. Every area, every aspect, every avenue of my life, I will be a good steward. Hallelujah. A good manager. Come on. Hallelujah. Every area. Yes, Jennifer, every area of my life. Come on. So that way I can be a reference in the earth of the blessings, come on, of the favor. When people look at me, I want them to see the hand of God on me. And even though whatever I have to deal with, and I know it may not be peaceable right now, it may not be nice right now, but I want the favor to show up in me. So when folks know what I'm dealing with, they know what I'm going through, they know whatever the case is, but the light of God will shine through me and I become a living testimony come on of the goodness and the favor of god hallelujah oh god so god tonight bless bless us your people god i pray god that god you continue to move and god you continue to have your way in our lives you continue to bless and keep and honor god we pray god that you just uh we thank you god for being our our father that we can approach you as friend and we can approach you as judge and Father, we're not ashamed and we're not afraid. We're bold. That's why Hebrews said we can, we can come to the throne of grace boldly. <laughs> we can approach the bench boldly. Come on, we don't need a high priest to go before us because the high priest already torn the veil. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. And so now as we uh, present to the judge any case that may be against us, hallelujah. God, we pray tonight that you give us wisdom wisdom on how to maneuver how to move in our lives in our families in our bloodline in my home that we may see the favor in the hand of god move mightily with no restrictions come on no limits no boundaries hallelujah no limits no boundaries and i pray god that Anything that may try to hold us hostage is removed in the name of Jesus. No more accusations. Come on. And if there, and if there happens to be an open case against me, come on. God, I pray, God, now that we repent. Anything I said or done 
I repent that the case cannot be used against me. Because <laughs> I'm free in Jesus' name. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth. And it's the truth that sets you free. Come on. If the truth sets us free, that, mean, it mean, that means a lie that keeps us bound. Hallelujah. So I thank God for you tonight. I pray that you are blessed. I pray, I pray that you are blessed tonight. I pray the uh, the hand of God was was speaking to you uh, tonight. I pray that uh, God uh, will show Himself mightily in your family, in your life, in your friends, um, in your work, in your everyday basis. Um, we'll continue next week, like uh, like I said, in the sin of uh, transgression and iniquity. And we'll talk about us being judges and the importance of what that looks like and what does that mean for our family. And so I pray this series uh, have been blessing to you. Uh, I pray that it, it continues to, to, to give you just a hunger to, to, to walk in this authority, to walk in who God calls you to be um, in whatever area of the life that you know you may be dealing with or struggling in. I pray that you begin to feel the bondages being broken and the shackles being loosed off your mind, um, that God will continue to show his hand strong ever before you. And so you guys be blessed tonight. Um, listen, Sunday will be in person. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Sunday will be in person. So like I always say, invite a friend, invite a family member. Uh, we'll be in the same space, same location. Uh, bring, bring, bring the kiddos. Bring the kiddos. Uh, we want to give them a little trinkets for... Uh, um uh christmas and uh, we will be like 14 days away but still you know put on the tree uh <laughs> um uh, uh uh you know because uh that will be our last um in person for the year so as we kick off next year we'll be more in person you know every other week but more details for that to come so join us um uh, next sunday uh it will again we'll have a good time last time it was in person man we keep talking about it but man that was powerful uh,